Our next speaker is Brooke Dixon. Brooke came to this program with experience as a swim and scuba instructor, monitoring aquatic nuisance species with Colorado Parks and Wildlife, working as an educator and assistant program director with the Catalina Island Marine Institute, and most recently served as director of a small nonprofit getting Denver's youth involved in ocean conservation. She's enjoyed the collaborative nature of her capstone as an excite and is excited to continue her work on this project to experience as much of the marine spatial planning process as her summer classes allow her to do. In my experience, I sat on Brooke's capstone committee. She is a capable, driven, and hardworking human who wants to understand everything, like why the Endangered Species Act says that distinct population segments only apply to vertebrates. She wants to understand it all and has the highest standards for herself in the quality of her work. She's committed to following her gut on and working with purpose, even if it's complicated. In short, she's a student after my own heart. It's been a pleasure to see her challenge herself and meet those high standards with her project today and with this presentation. The name of her presentation is Creating Opportunity for Community Engagement in Marine Spatial Planning, Developing an Ocean Use Survey Strategy for the Maldives. Thank you, Samantha. The Maldives is the lowest lying nation in the world. Over 80% of its land rises less than one meter above sea level. In 2009, former President Nasheed famously held the world's first underwater cabinet meeting to draw global attention to the issues of coastal erosion and sea level rise in the Maldives. He and 13 government officials sat 20 feet beneath the surface and signed a document calling on all countries to reduce their carbon dioxide emissions. Current projections warn that many of the lowest islands could be submerged by 2100, but Maldivians are fighting back. Over the past decade, they have been leaders in the fight against climate change and have amplified their own efforts to invest in sustainability and protect coastal resources. The Maldives is an archipelago located in the Arabian Sea south of India. It is 99% water. The red line highlights the country's exclusive economic zone or the extent of the Maldives jurisdiction. <clears throat> there are currently 1,192 islands grouped into atolls, which are the ring-shaped coral reefs you see on the screen. White sand beaches, spectacular marine life, and lavish overwater bungalows draw in nearly 2 million tourists annually, accounting for the majority of the Maldives' GDP. And with a Poland line tuna fishery that is one of the most sustainable in the world, Fishing is the second leading sector. 71% of Maldivians rely on the ocean for their primary source of income, and it plays an important cultural role as well. Through the creation of the new Rajay program, and with support from a network of organizations belonging to the Blue Prosperity Coalition, the Maldivian government has agreed to preserve at least 20% of their waters as fully protected areas. In order to gain a well-rounded understanding of how a potential zoning plan might impact Maldivians and their livelihoods, the marine spatial planning process will involve a high degree of stakeholder and community engagement. This is primarily accomplished through the deployment of ocean use surveys, which aim to establish a multi-stakeholder baseline of ocean use and relative value. Not only does this provide the science team drafting the proposed plans with valuable insights on how to minimize negative impacts while maximizing benefits for people and nature, it enables the community to play a role in an important decision-making process and ideally leads to long-term success because of the level of community buy-in. In order to understand the populations of stakeholders that need to be surveyed and how best to engage with them, a strategy for the Ocean Use Survey is needed. So for my project, I wanted to develop that comprehensive operational strategy for the development and deployment of the Ocean Use Survey in the Maldives. Given that I would be generating a plan to achieve sector and nationwide engagement, I felt that a crucial first step would be to provide myself with a frame of reference. So I went to the Maldives. I traveled to an island in North Ari Atoll called Razdu. Razdu is one of 194 inhabited islands in the Maldives. An inhabited island is also known as a community island or residential island. It's one that Maldivians live on, as opposed to a resort island, which houses only one resort and its staff. While staying at a charming little guest house on Razdu, I met the most wonderful people. I asked too many questions over coffee and betel nuts. I experienced the local council election excitement. 
and I learned that internet is a finite commodity. <laughs> Visiting the Maldives provided me with a strong conceptual understanding of the expansive country, its rich biodiversity, culture, and community, and insights that proved instrumental as I devised a plan of action for the Ocean Use Survey. So what are Ocean Use Surveys? They are participatory mapping surveys, which ask respondents to identify areas in the coastal marine environments that they value or use. The survey is made accessible to the public through the Sea Sketch tool developed by the McClintock Lab at UC Santa Barbara, as well as through the Mapshenere Community Engagement Platform. Community members are able to select the sector that they identify with, draw shapes and locations they utilize, and assign a point value for each shape up to 100 points. They can also provide general comments to specify why they might value a certain area. The responses collected from these surveys are used to produce a baseline of ocean use and value and are often the most comprehensive representation of sector-based interest in a country. Heat maps are one technique used to highlight areas identified most frequently and areas assigned high point values by respondents. This is a heat map generated from ocean use survey responses in the Caribbean island of Montserrat from a previous marine spatial planning project. It's showing fishing value in the country's coastal waters with high area, areas of high value noted in red and orange and areas of lower value uh, noted in blue and yellow. The Ocean Use Survey is itself a lengthy multi-stage process. So I'll briefly outline the four main phases of the full process and then I'll really focus on the pre-planning and planning phases as that is what I could accomplish in the scope of my capstone timeframe. So the pre-planning pre process began in early March when we formed a working group with representation from the new Rajay program, the Waite Institute, the McClintock Lab, and myself as project lead. The, um, sorry, I spent over a month <laughs> reading and cataloging all existing tabular and spatial data that reflect ocean uses in the country and identifying data gaps that could potentially be filled by the Ocean Use Survey. The planning process involved identifying key stakeholder sectors to be targeted for engagement with the Ocean Use Survey, doing a power analysis to establish survey targets at the sector, island, and atoll levels, designing the survey and building it, which was largely done by the McClintock Lab, uh, flagging positions that needed to be filled, developing an outreach plan, and developing a cost estimation for survey implementation all of which went into the deployment strategy, which I'll go into a bit of detail about shortly. The deployment phase has not yet started, but will include approximately six months of passive survey deployment and facilitated surveys. Responses will be closely monitored to ensure that we're reaching survey targets, and the survey strategy will be adapted as needed throughout this phase to reach those targets. After the deployment phase will be the analysis and reporting phase. In this section, there will be a three-week period of public consultation during which the public can view the final reports and heat maps to provide feedback about whether they feel that that is an accurate representation of their ocean use and value. Once the feedback process ends, the heat maps will be used by the Marine Spatial Planning Modeling Team to help them identify areas best suited for zoning purposes. So now we'll dive back into the planning phase and the contents of the strategy. This is the finalized a list of stakeholder groups to be targeted for engagement with the Ocean Use Survey. As I mentioned earlier, tourism and fisheries are the big ones. We'll aim to solicit responses from commercial, recreational, and subsistence fishers across the country. Each of the 164 resorts currently operating, guest houses on inhabited islands, dive centers, and liveaboards, which are known in the Maldives as safari vessels. We'd also like to better understand cultural use and value, community recreational uses, areas where research and conservation are occurring, as well as use and value in the transportation, shipping, construction, utilities, and defense sectors. The Maldives Ocean Use Survey will utilize four modes of survey deployment, passive deployment or self-report, a one-on-one -on -one moderated survey, which involves one survey facilitator assisting one respondent in completing the survey, a group response, which is when one person will fill out the survey on behalf of a group of people within the same sector who theoretically share similar use and value. And then uh, a fourth method, which is specific to the Maldives because of their sense of community, is a moderated community gathering. So I'll go into a little bit of detail about this as it is unique to the Maldives. These will take place on inhabited islands. Um, inhabited islands each have an island council with a lot of influence in the community. So the local island councils will help us gather people for this participation. 
Uh, these will be largely sector specific meetings because while the Maldives does have a very strong sense of community, they also have a lot of conflicting ocean uses. Um, there's going to be an instructional and interactive video that is shown to them through which they can follow along with Mapsionaire on their mobile device or SeaSketch on their laptop. And that'll be followed by a Q&A session with the facilitators who will then assist respondents in completing the survey. It should be about an hour for each of these meetings. Based on the data I collected and the information from past ocean use survey projects, I anticipate that self-report will occur within conservation organizations in the aquaculture and mariculture sector and in the dive sector. However, we expect that most of the responses that we get from this survey are going to be using a facilitator. So we expect that fisheries is going to be heavily reliant on one-to-one -one moderated surveys, whereas cultural and community recreational uses can probably, we can probably reach those targets with these moderated community gatherings. Um, I am heavily expecting that we'll be able to solicit uh, group responses in the utilities, construction, shipping, and defense sectors. Something that I learned while visiting the Maldives is how involved the population is with social media. So we are going to use that uh, substantially to reach out and, and garner participation in the survey. These logos on the screen are their most used platforms, so we'll really target those. Television interviews and commercials, as well as radio and newspaper advertisements, will also occur throughout the six-month deployment period as, as needed to reach these targets. Two survey facilitators per each of the 20 administrative atolls will be hired. They'll travel together to each of the islands within their atoll, a minimum of two times each, to host these moderated community gatherings and facilitate the one-to-one -one surveys. As you can see from the cost breakdown, site visits will account for a majority of the costs. Um, this was not surprising as the Maldives is the most geographically dispersed country in the world and we will be attempting at least 388 site visits. <laughs> so where are we now in the process? Survey facilitators are being sought out. The Ocean Use Survey itself is being finalized and run through the necessary review channels. The strategy is not quite finalized. I will be meeting with the Ministry of Health uh, to discuss a COVID risk management plan and a contingency plan for islands that have positive cases, as facilitators will not be able to travel there. Uh, we will complete a small survey pretest in the capital of Male to ensure that translations of technical terms make sense. That will be followed by a soft launch on a single atoll and uh, hopefully work out all the kinks there before deploying countrywide in two months. So we are optimistic that in two months, we are gonna start that six month deployment period after which uh, heat maps will, of ocean use and value in the Maldives will be submitted to the marine spatial planning process, hopefully in early 2022. And from there, the science team will produce trade-off models that, uh, for potential zoning that will allow the Maldivian government to make informed decisions that reduce conflict while meeting conservation objectives. So I just want to stress how collaborative this project has been. So I owe a really big thank you to my entire capstone committee, uh, Andy, Will, Nistu, and Samantha, especially those of you that also served on the Maldives Working Group and met with me constantly. Uh, the rest of the Maldives Working Group, Maddie, Munchita, and Uta, uh, everybody at the Waite Institute was so encouraging and helpful. Uh, thank you to the new Raj site team and the Maldivian government for allowing me to insert myself into this process. Uh, all of my new friends on RASDU that I'll probably be going back to see, hopefully very soon. <laughs> uh, MAS NBC leadership, my cohort and our WhatsApp chat uh, has been hilarious and awesome. And um, all my friends and family for their love and support, especially my husband, David. Thank you. So I have a question about the heat maps. What yes. would cause gaps like the one you showed in your sample to show up? So, you know, it's like there's survey all around it except for this one part on the northern part of that island there. Are you talking about where there wasn't like a color mm -hmm. on the heat map? I mean, realistically, it could have been places that people didn't identify that they used for any reason. I mean, I think that specific example was just coastal. So it was a three nautical mile uh, circle around it. So it could have been areas that nobody identified. It might have been, I'm not sure about all the details of that survey, that was just one example of the heat map that I was allowed to share. Um, so I can't say it for certain, but it could have been areas that somebody didn't identify. It also could have been uh, the method that they used to, so there are two methods that they used to develop the heat maps. There's a weighted method and an unweighted method. So 
I'm not a GIS expert. <laughs> I hope to be someday, but I am not today. Um, so I don't know for certain, but it could have been they used one of those methods and it turned up with areas that were blank, but sorry that I don't have a better answer for that. And Brooke, we have a question that came in from the web. Uh, this is from Jordan from Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> Are the moderators going to be locals and or community leaders? And how do you ensure the moderator does not bias or unfairly influence a community survey report? Wow, that is an excellent question, Jordan from Boulder. Um, so they will all be local. We are seeking out survey facilitators that are Moldavian people. Uh, we are in discussion with a lot of different uh, people in that country to kind of hopefully hire survey facilitators that are experienced survey facilitators. This is not the first time that a participatory mapping survey has been done in the Maldives. So we've met with their National Bureau of Statistics that um, have hired these survey facilitators before. Uh, they've given us a lot of tips and tricks on kind of how to look for the right people. Um, so we are, we are in the process of looking for them and we're hoping that we can get really experienced survey facilitators, which will hopefully minimize the bias. Um, but we do not have a specific system in place at this moment for how to do that. I'm sure that that will be coming. The strategy is not finalized. <laughs> Great, and we have one more question that came in from the web. Uh, they write, "Great project. You mentioned that internet is a limited resource. So, as such, what delivery mode or outreach plan do you think will be most successful in the early stages of survey deployment?" I just realized I forgot to mention that there will also be paper maps, <laughs> it's a key thing to remember. So yes, we will have paper maps available um, for internet snafus. Uh, we also have a plan in place for SIM cards. So our facilitators will be carrying around SIM cards. They will be able to hopefully provide internet for these moderated community gatherings and for their one-to-one -one, uh, survey facilitations. So we are optimistic that that's kind of going to be able to uh, ease that, that problem. Uh, the issue that I experienced was that it is, uh, you, you, in the Maldives, you buy at the beginning of the month, and then it just kind of slowly drains. So I got there at the end of the month, so that was, that was really fun. Um, so we're just, yeah, we're going to prepare our survey facilitators with SIM cards. We are going to have paper maps on hand for people to use in the event that that is necessary or that they want to, because that's always an option. Thank you. <laughs>